As we start the new year, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who supports the AIDS Foundation of Chicago and the local and national AIDS fight for your sustained commitment to the work bringing about a world without AIDS. Uh, 2012 was a pretty spectacular year. The International AIDS Conference was on U.S. soil. The AIDS Foundation of Chicago played a big presence in making sure that AIDS advocacy, and particularly the national and local story of how we were fighting AIDS, uh, was told. And we engaged with state and local officials throughout the year. It was a challenging year. We saw state budget cuts for HIV prevention. About $3.3 million was cut from community grants that go to prevention, housing, and other essential services that are needed to keep up the fight. But it was a, an important year to engage individuals from all walks and sections of our great community in Chicago. We had an amazing spring dinner with playwright Tony Kushner. We had hundreds of people in the half marathon, triathlon, even half Ironman and Chicago marathon supporting the fight against AIDS. Our run and walk was uh, one of the best ever at Soldier Field, and we ended the year with a fantastic uh, World of Chocolate uh, event, which is always a, a fantastic way to, to end the year. And Dance for Life continues to be one of our, our most treasured times of the year when the dance community comes together to showcase their the talent and commitment for the fight against AIDS. All of this is to support uh, an array of services that the AIDS Foundation of Chicago is involved in making sure are available including testing for more than 5,000 individuals, case management for about 5,000 individuals who are living with HIV and need help gaining access to clinical care and other essential services, housing for over 1,500 HIV-affected households, and then sustained advocacy uh, at the local, state, and national level. So in 2013, we're looking forward to continuing our work in advocacy to try to bring about stronger, integrated service networks that will serve the HIV-related needs of, of those uh, in our networks, but also help them gain access to the other essential mental health, substance abuse, and essential services they need. We're going to work really hard through all of our networks and through all of our advocacy to make sure that affected populations are, <clears throat> we're, we're responding to all the, the comprehensive and holistic needs of affected populations. And we're going to continue to make sure that we can improve outcomes in every stage of HIV care. So we're looking forward to your support in 2013. The conference was significant because it was the first time in 22 years that this assembly had been back on U.S. soil thanks to administrative and congressional action to lift a long-standing ban against HIV-positive foreigners entering the country. And for those of us in the United States, it was an important opportunity to shine a light on the continuing AIDS crisis in the United States and for us to tell our story about how we're championing an end to AIDS. I think for, from our perspective, we really focused on efforts to implement the National AIDS Strategy. We looked at populations uh, and strategies that, the, that we need to scale up for most affected populations in the United States. There was important and pretty frightening statistics uh, unveiled in Washington, D.C. about the disproportionate impact of HIV among African-American gay men, uh, that by age 40, about 6 in 10 of, of men uh, among African-American gay men are living with HIV. We also focused on issues like criminal, uh, criminalization laws that are hindering our efforts to expand HIV testing, HIV treatment. And really, the, the biggest focus of all was uh, this dichotomy where we have right now incredibly powerful medical tools uh, that not only can help people with HIV live longer and improve their health, but now we have evidence can be a very powerful tool in slowing the rate of new infections, and yet uh, less than a third of all people living with HIV in the United States are, uh, are benefiting or are, are, are experiencing maximum benefit from these treatments. And half of people with HIV, less than half of people with HIV in the United States are sustained in clinical care or treatment. So we have a, a long road ahead, but it was encouraging to have this discussion in the U.S. and hear from from leading uh, state and federal officials talk about 
the nation's commitment to the fight against AIDS. What, uh, what was what was AFC's presence there? How did how did the AIDS Foundation of Chicago contribute to the International AIDS Conference? So at the International AIDS Conference, the, the AIDS Foundation had a very large presence. We had eight posters that were covering several of our policy and policy campaigns, our our work and research on linkage to care as well as our efforts around rectal microbicides and female condoms. So it was exciting, an exciting chance for us to share our, the lessons learned with the rest of the international community looking at HIV AIDS. Uh, I had the, the privilege of co-chairing the community program committee. It was one of the, the main organizers of the conference. We uh, were invited to the White House to meet the president and uh, were there with an international delegation which is very exciting and exciting to hear his personal commitments as president to the continued fight against AIDS. Uh, our vice chair for community um, uh, affairs, Reverend Charles Strait, uh, opened the conference uh, in, the, in an invocation. And AFC's HIV Prevention Justice Alliance hosted a space for human rights advocates from around the world to share uh, best strategies and recommit to uh, ensuring that human rights approaches are part of the response to HIV. You've been an AIDS ad activist for more than 20 years, so, right? 20 to 30 years, something like that? Uh, 20 plus, yes. 20 plus. <laughs> um, what, was, what was it like for you to be part of that Weekend End AIDS mobilization? So for, for me, the Weekend End AIDS mobilization was an important opportunity for us to be marching in the streets of Washington, D.C., you know, kind of the seat of power in the United States, and making sure that folks that are outside the conference uh, hear from us and recognize that much more needs to be done to fight AIDS uh, locally and internationally. And really, the, one of the big themes of the conference is that we're, you know, we have this incredibly powerful set of tools and knowledge that we've amassed in 30 years fighting the epidemic. And we can make, we have you know, empirical evidence that we can make incredible progress fighting AIDS if we put all the things that we know work to use. And yet we're facing a domestic and global economic crisis. We're seeing funding cuts and we're seeing that in our own state in Illinois. And all of this is going to hamper our progress against HIV and that has both a humanitarian impact. It means more people will become HIV positive and more people will suffer and die from this disease needlessly. It also means that uh, without, if we don't take the actions now to curb rates of new infection and reduce illness from HIV, those are also healthcare costs that society, uh, in our case in the United States, will have to bear. And so, you know, this is an epidemic that we can stop. And we actually, you know, even though we don't have a vaccine or a cure, we have so many tools at our disposal to make a difference. So right now, the the real tragedy is: will we take the action needed? to uh, halt this epidemic. Were there any uh, kind of personally moving moments at the conference for you, any kind of chills or goosebumps kind of moments, whether it was at the protest or at one of the, hearing one of the speakers or just interacting with different activists or people from around the world? Well, for me, the, one of the, the most significant times at the conference was on the first day during the plenary session uh, that began with a medical overview, scientific overview from Dr. Tony Fauci of the National Institutes of Health, followed by my dear friend Phil Wilson from the Black AIDS Institute, who talked about the U.S. AIDS epidemic, and ended with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton talking about the U.S. commitment to pursue an AIDS-free generation. And so, you know, each one of those talks is really powerful. Uh, the you know, Dr. Fauci underscored kind of the the medical tools at our disposal, and the real possibility we now have to make enormous progress against the epidemic. Phil uh, was very moving, and he, he peppered his remarks with anecdotal stories of real people, uh, both living and, and passed away to HIV AIDS, and talked about a story I shared with him about uh, a young undocumented individual who passed away in the early 90s and uh, sadly never benefited from these treatments and never, you know, and, and died uh, practically anonymously because he lived under an alias uh, to protect himself as an undocumented individual. So that was very moving to, to hear that story 
from the podium. And, and Secretary Clinton was also very powerful, reiterating that we can make this progress uh, in framing kind of this, this, this call to action and committing the U.S. government to what she's calling an AIDS-free generation, which is uh, essentially eliminating mother to child HIV transmission in the world by 2015 and helping those of us living with HIV live the long, you know, have a long, healthy life. So these are big, lofty goals, but they're, they're possible. Uh, but we have to sustain the fight. Uh, you mentioned the, the study that um, highlighted recent trends in rise, rise in infections among young uh, African-American gay bi men. Um, what is AFC doing about that? What are we going to be doing about that in 2013? So one of the key data findings that was released at the International AIDS Conference in Washington was a study called uh, HPTN 061. It was a national study that enrolled thousands of African-American gay bisexual men. And uh, one of the lead researchers is from Loyola University here, Dr. Wheeler. And uh, the study found enormously high rates of HIV among the cohort. And interestingly, even though the rates are very high at every age group, uh, the study underscored that there's no higher rates of risk-taking uh, among individuals in the cohort, which means that you know, there are other factors like uh, unequal access to health services, to prevention, to education, and high rates of poverty and other issues that are contributing to high rates of HIV and, and a high concentration of HIV in this community. So these are, this, this study is, didn't surprise anyone who's doing work on AIDS, but it gave us another tool to substantiate that there's an enormous growing crisis among black and gay, African American men, and something that we need to respond to. And, and AFC is working very hard through our testing program to make sure that we can identify uh, up to 300 HIV positive uh, individuals, particularly in, among gay men, uh, in communities of color that currently are living with HIV and don't know it, and link them to continuous high quality clinical care and support services so that the, their life expectancy and their networks can benefit from, from uh, and it begins by knowing their diagnosis. So that's one key thing that we're doing. Uh, obviously all the education that we do is really critical. Um, every every uh, program that we're working on has a component responding to the needs of this population. So our housing programs, our case management programs, our policy programs, all are aimed at uh, making sure that we can advance kind of what uh, effective services and strategies where HIV is most concentrated and no group is more highly affected than African American gay bisexual men. Um, do you want to talk at all about how the new strategic plan is sort of addressing that and get into that at all, or is that, do you want to leave that be for now? Um, I mean, I would frame it in more in kind of like our plans for 2013. Yeah. <clears throat> which, I, which is kind of the same, you know, yeah. whether it gets caught, I mean, I think it's going to be codified in the strategic plan, but if it's, okay. in, in case it gets, in case the strategic plan gets retooled a little bit. Yeah. No. Okay. <clears throat> um, what about um, maybe just a little bit on the significance of AFC doing more direct service than previously. What does that mean for kind of the Chicago HIV sector? Oh, uh, that's all. Yeah, we can't talk about that. No? I mean, well, we can talk about it, but it's, um, we, we're not going to talk about I mean, the way we talk about it is not going to be in that kind of frame. Okay. Like, yeah. We can talk about it off, off camera. I mean, yeah. the, um, uh, in 2013, AFC has uh, some significant, you know, uh, significantly uh, start over. Uh, in 2013, AFC is really going to be focusing on the most pressing, you know, opportunities and challenges facing uh, the AIDS sector. And you know, the most important right now is figuring out how we implement and how we shepherd the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, the federal health reform law. And the law <coughs> can be a game changer for the fight against AIDS. Uh, in an epidemic where there's less than 50% of people living with HIV sustained in clinical care or treatment, uh, we need to do a much better job making sure that people with HIV gain access to clinical care and have a, a, an array of support services that they need to uh, avail entry and, and retention in care. So that's really going to be one of our significant, significant initiatives all year long because most of the 
of the, of the provisions of the federal law will go into effect in January. Now, for HIV, this is going to be a big challenge because we're going to be seeing more integrated services and we're going to be seeing networks of care emerging that are going to be designed to meet kind of the holistic health needs of diverse populations. And this can be very good for people with HIV. Uh, HIV is not the only health issue that our clients face. Uh, but we need to make sure that as we move into this integrated uh, and comprehensive uh, platform of services, that we don't lose the expert HIV care and the cultural competency that we've developed over 25 years to provide excellent customer service, excellent engagement for our vulnerable populations, which include a substantial number of gay men, transgender individuals, individuals with a history of drug use or addiction, homeless individuals, and folks coming out of prisons or jail. So this is going to be a big challenge and something that the whole AIDS service sector has to figure out, has to get it right, uh, because we need to benefit from the health reform uh, legislation, and we're excited that laws being implemented, but we also have to make sure that we don't lose any of that special specialized service services that, that, that have made the big difference in the epidemic. Uh, the other initiatives that AFC is going to be really focusing on is working closely with our partners uh, across the city and in the state and local health departments to improve outcomes at every stage of HIV care. That means making sure that we can uh, identify and help people who, with undiagnosed HIV learn their diagnosis, get them linked to care, help them stay in care, and make sure that, that the medications, the diagnostics, and the outpatient and inpatient services they need are available when they need them. So making sure that you know, folks can move through this continuum uh, seamlessly and not get lost in the cracks is going to be a really important focus for 2013 and beyond. Do you want to say anything more about what we were able to accomplish on the policy side of things in uh, 2012, like the you know fighting the budget cuts, but also with the criminalization law, changing that? Well, 2012 was a tough year in Illinois AIDS policy. We mitigated some of the worst cuts, but we weren't able to uh, avoid them. Uh, there were more than four million in HIV cuts that were slated in the governor's proposed budget. We were successful at reducing that by about $700,000, so that's good. Uh, but the system still experienced about a uh, $3.3 million reduction in community grants that is essential for making sure that we have adequate amount of prevention services, care services, housing, and the whole array of interventions. So we're going to be working very hard in 2013 to make sure that we're fighting uh, and trying to restore some of those budget cuts. Uh, we made some gains uh, around advancing some uh, amendments to the state's criminal, uh, criminaliza HIV criminalization law. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really some good news. We made sure we added, we were successful at advocating that with the legislature that provisions be added, that the law include uh, provisions that um, folks that are charged with and convicted of, of criminal HIV transmission uh, prove intent to harm. We also narrowed the kinds of behaviors that are, that are covered by this, by this law to include only those that can actually transmit HIV. Sadly, the, we weren't able to repeal the bill, to repeal the law, and, um, and we're still going to see individuals affected by, by this criminal statute. Uh, and we think that, you know, we think it has an effect on inhibiting individuals from accepting testing and, ex and accepting uh, care and treatment. But uh, by narrowing the scope of the law, hopefully fewer people will be caught up by this, by this measure. And, you know, really that, you know, really what we're trying to make sure that we do is um, at this broad kind of law that's meant to uh, criminalize individuals that are uh, knowingly and um, deliberately trying to spread HIV, um, that the law actually, um, you know, has a tool against, you know, those very rare cases uh, without um, affecting lots of other people that maybe um, inadvertently, um, because of fear of stigma or discrimination, are not disclosing their status. So 
it's a it's a it's a complicated effort, but we've been doing a lot of work on this on this effort, and we're proud that we're making some incremental progress on this bill. I know in the the next legislative session, in, in addition to trying to fight any further budget cuts, we're going to be working on uh, bills pertaining to anti-bullying and uh, sex education. Uh, do you want to say anything about you know what what's the importance of that? Yeah, I mean by December we might already have sex ed passed. So I don't know. Okay. I mean, like the little window of opportunity is going to be in December. Um, I can say in twenty in twenty thirteen we're going to continue to look at some of the social determinant of health issues mm -hmm. that we know, you know, raise the risk of people becoming infected with HIV. So we need to continue to monitor policy and law to help curb the epidemic of bullying in schools and homes and in communities. We have ample evidence that young people who are bullied, um, that compounds their risk for HIV in early adulthood and later in life. Uh, we want to make sure that young people receive uh, the best education about their sexual health, that they're encouraged to delay the debut of, of their sexual lives, uh, but are equipped with the, the accurate information uh, how to protect themselves when they they do begin to be sexually active. Uh, and again, we want to make sure that uh, the health reform is put into place in a way that's designed to meet the needs of people with chronic medical conditions like HIV. And that's going to be our number one focus. Uh, in, in 2012, the, the phrase AIDS-free generation came up and it was, well, it was used quite often from starting with Secretary Hillary Clinton's speech. Uh, it, invoking this this kind of idea of the AIDS free generation and it's been used a lot since then. I mean what is what does that phrase mean to you? Well you know I, you know we're excited that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in her term you know advanced this, this kind of idea of an AIDS free generation and it's a powerful powerful message. And I think what it means is that there can be future generations that are growing up in a world that's less affected by HIV than our current generation. That's very powerful. Um, I think we're still figuring out kind of how we're going to get there and what that means. Uh, an AIDS-free generation is certainly not an HIV-free generation. Unfortunately, we still uh, have in the U.S. 1.1 million people living with HIV. Uh, we still have 50,000 new infections. And worldwide, over 33 million individuals are living with HIV. So we're still far away from, from halting new infections. Uh, but an AIDS-free generation means that those, who, those of us who are living with HIV can uh, slow the impact of the virus on our bodies and live long, healthy, rewarding, and, and healthy lives. And we can you know, work hard to make sure that, uh, particularly for younger generations, for infants and adolescents, HIV is not something that they have to worry about. And sadly, that's not the case today. In many parts of the developing world, um, there's, there are tens of thousands of young people who are infected because their, their mothers didn't receive the testing, the treatment, and the preventative care that could have averted infection. And sadly, their many, in many cases, uh, their mothers aren't receiving the care after they're born, uh, which is resulting in this uh, you know, fledging uh, epidemic of AIDS orphans. Uh, and in the United States, even though we've curbed mother-to-child HIV transmission significantly, we still have a huge epidemic of sexually transmitted HIV among adolescents and young adults. And this is, uh, cuts across all our communities. Uh, it's most, most pronounced in communities of color among uh, young boys and girls. And young, uh, young men who are uh, gay or bisexual really bear the brunt. Uh, we've seen in the last four years, African-American gay and bisexual young men are the only group with increasing rates of new infections, and a 48% increase in the last four years. So we have a lot of work to do to, uh, to, to make sure that the next generation is, you know, is, 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 is coming into the world in, you know, with less fear of HIV, with less risk of having to contend with this deadly disease. But, you know, again, I think what's powerful about this concept of the age-free generation is articulating the, po the possibility if we use all the tools at our disposal. 
I felt like one of the really important parts of that um, the HPTN sixty one study was this I was the finding that it's not necessarily because of risky riskier behavior in those communities. It's it's social these other social determinants. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that and and how that plays out in um, communities of color? Sure. I mean, I think it's one of the big conundrums of the epidemic is why in a population like black gay and bisexual men, where there's evidence of no greater risk-taking, and in some cases uh, fewer fewer rates of risk-taking, so more use of condoms, fewer uh, sexual partners, why there's this burgeoning HIV epidemic. And uh, we're still trying to figure that out, but we, we have some clues. We think we know that um, in the African-American community and in you know, communities of color in general, there's lower rates of access to uh, clinical care, uh, lower rates of HIV testing acceptance, lower rates of, of utilization of HIV medications, you know, taking HIV meds. So that's raising the viral load. And so we know that people who have uncontrolled HIV are more likely to transmit the virus. So biologically, there's, there's more virus. Uh, we also know there's a lot of social issues that contribute. So poverty, uh, unstable housing, uh, the stresses, you know, even the stresses of, of violent communities, all of these things can affect the immune system and can uh, result in the individuals becoming exposed to HIV uh, or unknowingly infected with HIV. So there's, you know, really what's one of our key findings of the study is that we can't just work on HIV-only initiatives like finding the undiagnosed and getting people into care. We also have to deal with the whole community, holistically. And that's really one of the, the key initiatives that AAC is going to be working on in 2013 and beyond. It's making sure how do we help the entire community deal with, you know, things like low educational attainment, uh, things like the, the double-digit rates of unemployment among young black and gay men and transgender individuals. Um, how do we deal with other co-occurring infections like uh, sexually transmitted diseases that escalate the chance of acquiring or transmitting HIV. So it, you know, we have to deal with a, with a whole picture if we really want to make gains around HIV outcomes for this and other populations. Um, very general question, but I think an important one. Um, you know, we're more than 30 years into this epidemic. Why should people still care about HIV? You know, we're, we're at this point where um, progress has been made, but there's still much progress yet to go, you know, and, and so why should people feel hopeful and invigorated and why should people care? That's a great question. I mean, I think we get asked all the time, you know, is this, isn't it over in the U.S.? Uh, why should we care about, you know, ending AIDS? We, don't we have these powerful AIDS medications? I mean, I think, you know, I think right now we are at these crossroads. You know, in the early 90s, we had incredibly high rates of death um, in 94, 95 with 40,000, 50,000 age-related deaths, uh, predominantly affecting people in their 30s. Um, and back then we had no effective medical tools. Uh, the only thing we could offer people living with HIV was palliative care to ease their pain and suffering and help them die with dignity. And today the situation is, is much rosier. Uh, thankfully, we have a, an array of effective anti-HIV medications. We know substantially more about how to slow new infections, how to help people affected by the epidemic. Uh, so we have these tools. Uh, we don't have a vaccine or a cure, and it's still it's still a complicated, you know, a complicated uh, thing to be living with HIV. It's something we want to encourage people to prevent. But for those who are living with HIV, we have more to offer them. So I think right now, the, the situation that we're facing is that uh, we have uh, incredibly powerful tools to make a difference, uh, but we may not use them, um, we may not use them because of economic and political constraints. So it's kind of a, a deeper crisis in my, in my assessment. Uh, it's one thing in the early 80s and 90s, uh, we didn't have these tools available. So there wasn't even the possibility of, of bringing them to scale. Uh, now that we know that we could make a dramatic impact on halting the epidemic and helping those affected, to not do so uh, is quite a tragedy. And it impacts everyone. 
uh, we're having a big national debate about deficits, about health care, about health care costs. Uh, all of these issues uh, are intertwined with a fully preventable epidemic that if we slow now, uh, we would have to contend with later. And later means more people affected, more costly care, more lost productivity, more, uh, you know, more pain and suffering for populations affected. So, you know, I mean, the flip side of an AIDS-free generation is that we could see certain populations, particularly uh, African American and Latino populations, gay men, certain groups like drug users, um, and others uh, condemned to generational HIV if we don't put in, put in place steps now to reverse that course. What, what's the call to action for 2013? What can people do to make a difference? Well, I think for, for 2013, the call to action is we need to stay engaged in this fight. Uh, we have the tools to make a substantial difference. But it's going to require political will and economic will. And uh, we need to make sure that you know, as we you know, reform the way healthcare is financed and delivered in Illinois and in the United States, that we preserve you know, the, the core services that we've developed over 30 years to meet the needs of people with HIV. We can have an integrated, comprehensive, streamlined system that also provides expert HIV care. It doesn't have to be an either or, but we're going to have to really work hard to make sure that uh, as we, 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 we start to work on implementing health care reform, we don't lose all of the specialty services we've developed over 30 years and that are essential to making sure uh, uh, high, highly affected populations uh, have trusted uh, health care workers and institutions um, helping them uh, get the, the help and support that they need. But what, what can someone do, um, say someone's watching this and they're inspired and they want to do something, what can they do to help? the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Would you want this to be in looking into the camera? I saw at you for this question. Sure. Look in the camera. Hold on. That, I need to switch this over. Okay. Well, we invite everyone to help join the fight. There's so many ways that people concerned about this epidemic can participate and can help us create this AIDS-free generation. Obviously, we, we rely on donations and we ask everyone to think about the AIDS fight and the AIDS Foundation of Chicago and thinking about their annual char charitable giving. We have events throughout the year that are a great way to give back. Uh, we have lots of ways that people can participate, both directly through things like AIDS Run and Walk, Team to End AIDS, and other uh, incredible programs. We have volunteering, and we have uh, just getting information and sharing that with your uh, family and friends. And letting people know that you care about this cause is a very powerful way to, to make a difference. So we have something for everyone, and we encourage everyone to do what they can to, to join the, the movement to end AIDS.